Ever wonder about the intricate history and current situation of Moray, a border town of India and Myanmar? Nestled on this border, Moray plays a pivotal role in trade and connectivity initiatives not just between India and Myanmar, but also Thailand. Once known as Malanfai, this town has had a complex past, frequently changing hands between Manipur and Burma. World War II marked a significant turning point for Moray, transforming it into a cosmopolitan hub. The town began to flourish with the arrival of Burmese Indians following the departure of the British, but this diversity brought its own challenges. Moray's population, as per the last census, stood at 16,847, with a majority of scheduled tribes. The town is a melting pot of languages, with Tadu and Mai Tai being prominently spoken. But beneath this vibrant surface, simmer tensions between the ethnic groups, notably the Kukis and the Nagas. As we delve deeper, we will uncover the hidden tensions brewing beneath the surface of this vibrant town. The conflict in Moray isn't recent. It is a complex tale of territorial disputes and ethnic clashes. The idyllic town, a hub of trade and connectivity, became the epicenter of a struggle for control between the Kuki and the Maite. The Maite, under the guise of providing security, began to encroach upon the Kuki territory. As tensions escalated, the Arambai, a notorious terrorist group, joined the fray, further complicating the situation. The Kuki people, however, were not bystanders in this unfolding drama. They rallied their resources and volunteers, standing firm in the face of adversity and resisting the intrusion tooth and nail. The Maite militants, thwarted by the resilient Kuki resistance, began to use other tactics. When direct occupation proved challenging, they employed the Indian Army and state security forces, manipulating them to further their cause. And where they could, they used mob violence to terrorize the Kuki people, burning their villages and endangering their lives. But this was more than just a territorial dispute. It was an insidious attempt to erase the Kuki identity from Moray. The Maite labeled the Kuki as outsiders, illegal immigrants in their own land, a narrative that was far from the truth. Behind this facade, a more sinister plot was unfolding. The aim was not just to take control of the Kuki territory, but to erase the Kuki identity altogether. This was no random act of violence. It was a calculated move orchestrated by corrupt Maite politicians with hidden agendas. But the Kuki people, their volunteers, their army, and their women's wing stood firm, protecting their territory from these devilish politics and intruders. The struggle was just beginning, and the stakes were high for the Kuki people. As the conflict escalated, so did the tactics used by the Maite and the Indian Army. At this juncture of our story, the Maite found themselves unable to occupy Moray, the Kuki town, by conventional means. Their solution? They turned to the Indian Army and state security forces, using them as a proxy to try and gain control. This was no mere political maneuvering. The Maite's actions had real and devastating consequences for the Kuki people. When the military might of the Indian Army and state security forces wasn't enough, the Maite resorted to mob violence. They organized groups, fueled by anger and fear, to descend upon Kuki villages. Their orders burned them to the ground. But the violence didn't stop there. The Kuki people, residents of Mora, were targeted too. They were not spared from this wave of terror. The mob sought them out, aiming to drive them from their homes, their town, their land. This was more than just an attack on property. It was an attack on their identity, their heritage, their very existence. The Meite's goal was clear to remove the Kuki people from Moray, a Kuki city, a Kuki town. They sought to label the Kuki as outsiders, as illegal immigrants in their own land. But this was far from the truth. This was not about immigration or legality. It was about control. The Meite's hidden agenda was to take over and control Kuki territory. And these ideas weren't born in a vacuum. They stemmed from Meite corrupted politicians, using their power and influence to further their own interests at the expense of the Kuki people. But despite the violence, despite the terror, the Kuki people stood their ground. They refused to be driven from their homes, from their town. They resisted the Meite's attempts to take over their land, their city, their identity. They stood firm against the intruders and their devilish politics. The situation was dire, but the Kuki people stood firm. In the face of adversity, the Kuki people were not passive victims, but fierce protectors of their land. This was a narrative not of submission, but of resistance. 
It's a tale of a people who stood their ground, defending their homeland against the onslaught of external forces. The Kuki Volunteers, the Kuki Army, and the Kuki Women's Wing, they all stood shoulder to shoulder, an unyielding wall against the tide of political intrusion. Their resistance was more than just a show of strength. It was a demonstration of their deep-seated love for their land, their unwavering commitment to their community, and their steadfast refusal to be displaced. They were not merely defending a piece of land, they were defending their identity, their heritage, and their very existence. They were protecting a legacy that was passed down to them through generations, a legacy they were determined to pass on to their children and grandchildren. The Kuki resistance was not a sporadic reaction, but a strategic, organized response. The Kuki army, brave and resolute, was the backbone of this resistance. They were the guardians of the Kuki land, the sentinels who kept vigil even in the face of grave danger. The Kuki volunteers, young and old, lent their support, providing the much-needed manpower and resources. And then there was the Kuki women's wing, the unsung heroes who played a crucial role in this resistance. Their courage and resilience were nothing short of inspirational. But the battle was not just fought on the physical front. The Kuki people also had to contend with a psychological war, a war of narratives, of perceptions, of identities. They were called outsiders, illegal immigrants, in their own land. But they refused to let these labels define them. They knew who they were, the rightful inhabitants and guardians of the land they called home. The Kuki resistance was not an act of aggression, but an act of self-preservation. It was a fight for their rights, for their dignity, for their freedom. It was a fight against the erasure of their history, their culture, their very identity. But most of all, it was a fight for their future. A future where they could live in peace, in their own land, free from fear and oppression. The Kuki people's resilience was a beacon of hope in the midst of chaos. Their resistance was a testament to their courage, their unity, and their indomitable spirit. It was a reminder that even in the darkest of times, the human spirit can rise, can fight, can prevail. And that's the legacy of the Kuki resistance. A legacy of courage, of resilience, of hope. As the conflict raged on, the battlefield wasn't just physical. It was also a war of narratives. In a world where information is as vital as ammunition, the manipulation of narratives became a key strategy. The Maite adopted a shrewd approach, using false propaganda as a weapon to target kooky leaders and institutions in Moray. To understand the potency of this weapon, we must first appreciate the power of information. In the hands of the unscrupulous, it can be twisted, distorted, and weaponized to serve their interests. This was evident in the Maite's strategy. They used misinformation to paint the Kuki as outsiders and illegal immigrants, despite the Kuki's deep-rooted history in Moray. But the propaganda didn't stop there. The Maite targeted not just the Kuki people, but their institutions as well. Important commercial centers in Moray were not spared, as they were portrayed as symbols of Kuki intrusion. This was a strategic move. By targeting these institutions, the Maite aimed to undermine the Kuki's economic power and destabilize their stronghold in Moray. The spread of fake news was another tactic used to further their agenda. False stories were circulated, creating an environment of fear and mistrust. This was not just a random act of misinformation, but a calculated move to sow discord and confusion among the Kuki. The ultimate goal? To weaken the Kuki's resolve and make it easier for the Maite to exert their control over Moray. But the Maite's cunning use of propaganda went beyond misinformation. They also used it to target Kuki leaders directly. By painting these leaders as threats to security, they aimed to justify their oppressive actions and further their control over the region. In this age of information, propaganda became a powerful weapon. It was a war fought not just with guns and bullets, but with words and narratives. And as we'll see in the next scene, it was a weapon that could have far-reaching consequences. As we've seen, the history of Moray is complex and fraught with conflict. A town woven into the tapestry of time, Moore has borne witness to the shifting sands of power, the rise and fall of empires, and the enduring spirit of its people. The Kuki, in particular, have stood their ground steadfast in the face of adversity. Their resistance is a testament to their resilience and their unwavering commitment to protect their homeland. Yet their struggle is far from over. The echoes of conflict reverberate through the streets of Mora, as the Kuki continue to face threats and challenges. From the onslaught of state forces and Maite militants, to the insidious spread of false propaganda, 
the Kuki people remain vigilant and resolute. Their story is a potent reminder of the power of resilience and the importance of standing up for one's rights. It's a narrative that needs to be heard, a tale that deserves to be told. And you, dear viewer, can play a part in amplifying their voice. For more insightful content like this, subscribe to Zalangam Media. Together, we can shed light on stories that need to be told.